we, we, we kind of left off with alchemy <laughs> when we last we left our chemistry heroes. Um, and we said that alchemy contributed to chemistry, but not necessarily to understanding of the atom, because they were very much based in that Aristotelian idea of continuous matter, that there was no fundamental unit of stuff. Um, and it's fascinating stuff. There's a whole body of alchemical art. It was very... It's almost a combination between philosophy and magic and, you know, what we could call, like, proto-science, something that sort of... Today it looks a lot like pseudoscience. And what's interesting is there's actually... Um, you, you find sort of New Age references to alchemical ideas, and then they're passed off as being scientific. They're not. They're, they're sort of pseudoscientific. They sound like they're related to science, um, but it's, it's very distinctly different. And this, this kind of work and this kind of philosophy, again, this is more philosophical than scientific, though they're starting to do things that start to look scientific, um, holds sway for a very long time. Um, there was alchemical work and alchemical thought being published and alchemical art being created, um, probably, well, in ancient Greece, so, you know, BCE, for hmm, a couple thousand years. And as what we might call mad people are working in basements and dungeons and caves and sheds, time passes. <clears throat> Civilizations rose and fell. The Greeks, for instance the Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire, well, no, that comes later. <clears throat> There's a lot of time passing, and there isn't anything happening that advances our understanding of what matter is actually made of. And I, I put this in because... <clears throat> in a timeline format, it's really easy to see that your timeline looks like this. One, two, and then nothing, and then boom, 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 stuff happens. And there's this giant wasteland in terms of actual scientific chemical thought. So we've got eh, 1,500 years or so, 1,600 years, where science isn't advancing. Um, and the, the Aristotelian ideas hold sway, this idea of continuous matter. The, the school of atomist thought is completely neglected during this whole period, this epoch. Nothing really happens. So the important thing to think about in, that, in terms of that sort of chronological wasteland is that nobody is thinking about an atomist worldview. Nobody is thinking about the fundamental units of matter because they're assuming that they're these continuous things. Um, even though the alchemists are starting to think about things in a more scientific manner, they're starting to obtain some data. It's not data collection like we would recognize it today. It's not like great, fantastic, qualitative, well, it's more qualitative. Not a lot of quantitative stuff going on. That changes. So, so in the 1770s, and this is, if I've got anybody who, who has done some pretty serious history stuff, anybody here who took AP Euro? No? That hasn't been offered in the time you've been in the high school? Okay. Um, this kind of corresponds to the Renaissance in Europe. And we come out of the Dark Ages, um, the Age of Enlightenment, actually no, not Renaissance, the Age of Enlightenment. Renaissance is earlier, sorry. Um, so this is the Enlightenment. And we, we suddenly have this flowering of philosophy and of science. And in the 1770s through roughly the 1790s, up through about 1800, it's often called the chemical revolution. It's also sometimes called the quantitative revolution in chemistry 
So quantitative means what? Quant. Numerical data, yeah. This is numbers. This is hard numbers. This is the kind of data that gets people drooling, people who are science geeky. Um, and I, I like to call this also the age of rich white guys playing on the family estate. Because guess who was doing chemistry at this point in history? Rich white guys playing on the family estate. Um, this is one of my little sidebars because it's, to put this in historical context and to put your own lives in historical context, and maybe this echoes something that um, our speaker said earlier, the idea that everybody has a right to a free education is pretty radical. And for most people at this period in history, their primary concern was survival, getting enough calories, um, not dying of exposure, literally having a, a dry, relatively warm place to lay their head, and having something in their bellies. That, that was existence for probably, I don't know what percent, 90% of the population on the entire planet at this point in history. So the people who are able to do science are people who are assured enough of getting those needs met, who are assured enough that they don't have to worry about where their next meal is coming from, they don't have to worry about having a roof or a cave or some sort of shelter, some hovel over their head, um, and that gives them the freedom to do some additional thinking. Um, and it also gives them the freedom to have equipment and space um, to think, to experiment, to write. And so there were a lot of observations during this period. People were measuring things really carefully. This also corresponds to the development of better measuring tools and better processes for making better tools. Um, you can't take a lot of mass measurements until you have something that will give you precise answers, where you can be assured that as you repeat your measurements again and again and again, they actually mean something, that they're related to one another. I mean, even, you know, aside from accuracy, just getting to a level of some sort of precision measuring, you're not comparing rocks, you know, random rocks that you picked up. This is one, one stone's worth, this is two stone's worth. Well, how much did the stone weigh? I don't know. It's a stone, it's gray. Um, you have to have a certain level of sort of tools and what we could call scientific infrastructure to be able to do this kind of work. So you have this big boom. One of the early things that had been observed during this period of, of sort of the flowering of quantitative chemistry was when you burned something, it actually lost weight. Did you know that? A lot of things, when you burn them, actually lose some weight. They lose mass. Well... There were, there were some interesting early ideas to explain this. Um, sort of an alchemical idea was phlogiston. phlogiston. And it was this mysterious substance that, that caused flammability. So anything that could burn contained phlogiston. And phlogiston, when liberated from a physical substance by burning, then um, went into the air around the object. Um, you could measure how much phlogiston, whatever it's called, was in a living thing by, for instance, putting a mouse in a container that was tightly sealed, and the mouse would excrete phlogiston because we all know living things can burn. And when the atmosphere around the mouse had absorbed all the phlogiston that it could absorb, then the mouse would die. You may all have a different explanation for that. I don't know. So... These kind of, I mean, this, is, this sounds wacky, but you, when you have no basis, when you don't know what the heck is going on, you're putting together ideas to explain what you're seeing. And it was Lavoisier, we'll pick it up tomorrow with uh, 